In this module, we're doubling back on a topic we looked at earlier in the semester, that is gender identities and how gender differs from biological sex. You'll be learning about people and cultures other than our own that do not conform to the male-female binary, the history of transgender rights and how such people are depicted in popular culture today, as well as some fascinating research on both modern and ancient cases of gender identity expression. So the first thing to define then is gender identity, and that is an individual self-conception based on their association with masculine or feminine gender roles. So I like this figure. Um, it actually helps to kind of illustrate, you know, for sexual health rights in Canada, um, differences in terms of assigned sex, you know, male, female, or intersex, but then this just plethora of gender identities that are out there. I mean, even right here in the middle, it's saying, you know, your gender expression can involve infinite possibilities. Um, so it's up to the person to figure out for themselves. I mean, no one but yourself can determine what or who you are. <clears throat> A few of the most commonly encountered terms in terms of gender identities, though, are the following. Um, cisgendered, these are individuals who identif identify their gender with the gender and sex they were assigned to at birth. Transgenders, uh, transgender means individuals who identify with the gender that is the opposite of their biological sex. Transsexual is a term used for individuals who wish to alter their bodies through medical interventions such as surgery and hormonal therapy so that their physical being is better aligned with their gender identity. Non-binary uh, refers to individuals whose gender identity is not explicitly masculine or feminine. Genderqueer people may express a combination of masculinity and femininity or neither in their gender expression. And lastly, there's intersex, which is a variety of conditions in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't seem to fit the typical definitions of male or female. Many visibly intersex people are mutilated at infancy and early childhood by doctors to make the individual's sex characteristics conform to society's idea of what normal bodies should look like. So a particular example of this, um, you know, we see the parents themselves being the one who makes these decisions for children um, to help them to conform to a, one's, one sex assignment over the other. So this particular case is Christian Bolling, um, who was born with XX chromosomes, and that's the typical expression for a female, but had, she had ambiguous in, uh, genitalia. She, however, was raised as a boy per her, her parents' decision. Um, at 14, during an appendectomy surgery, the teenager was found to have a full set of female reproductive organs, including ovaries and fallopian tubes. While no testicular tissues were detected, Voling was diagnosed as having a mix of both male and female organs. She was informed of the presence of female organs and told she was 60% female. Voling suffered mental health issues as a consequence. Her typical, female typical chromosomal pattern was detected in 1977, but the results were not shared with her. Her awareness of her sexuality and her sexual orientation were analyzed, following, followed by surgery at age 18 that removed her female sexual organs, including her reproductive organs. The, the operation itself, she was told, was to remove both testicular and ovarian tissues, but there was actually no testicular tissue present. It was just to remove her female reproductive organs. Um, so in 2006, when she finally did obtain her medical records and found out the truth, she decided to then file a lawsuit within Germany. Um, she since then has become the first intersex person known to have successfully sued for damages due to non-consensual -cons surgical intervention. And that's a pretty huge step in terms of human rights issues in this particular subject. So when it comes to a person's identity and their sexuality, the two do not have to be connected, but they often are. Uh, a person can be sexually attracted to the opposite sex, to the same sex, to both sexes, to any sex, doesn't matter. Um, being queer, however, is seen as a radical and anti-assimilationist stance that captures multiple aspects of a person's identity. And for some, this reclamation is a celebration of not fitting into that norm or of 
being, you know, seen as abnormal. So kind of reclaiming that for themselves. And what you can see here is, you know, a really nice graphical depiction of identity, someone's gender orientation, their sex, how it's expressed overall. And these are spectrums, right? There's no particular place that a person has to align across all of these different spectra. The, 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 these things vary across people and across different societies and cultures. When it comes to this concept, though, of heteronormativity, uh, what we mean by that is that in many cultures, and by that I mean many patriarchal cultures, homosexuality, bisexuality, intersex, and queer are considered to be not normal or against nature. Queer theory, therefore, challenges heteronormativity as the assumption that heterosexuality is the one and only way to be human, because we know this is absolutely not true. In this sense, heteronormativity puts people into categories that are artificial, limiting, and very often inaccurate. And in this way, we're creating the other. And so this kind of harkens back to that concept of inside or outside, emic versus edict perspectives, you know, us versus them sort of attitudes. And so if you're, you're artificially creating another, then there's going to be other consequences that come from that sort of categorization. So why do we put people into categories? Well, sexuality is a so social construct. We know that to be true because it organizes people in different ways in different societies. However, to finish this quote from, from Giddens, it operates within the field of power. So people are organizers. We like to organize and understand people. Um, but when that's put into this field of power, this is where that concept of marginalization comes in from way back at the beginning of the semester. So are we marginalizing the marginalized uh, with these further categories? You know, we've already seen women themselves as a mar marginalized category. So if we're looking at other gender identities within that greater category of women, you know, this is where this we need to remember back to what we talked about earlier on. Do we really need a feminist anthropology or are we just continuing to marginalize the margin, those who are already marginalized? Um, yeah. So this then begs the question, you know, is heterosexuality normal in nature? Well, despite observer bias up to the 1990s, over 500 animal species have exhibited one or more forms of homosexual behavior. And so this includes sex, courtship, affection, pair bonding, or parenting. This is only, you know, a subset of those 500. Um, now, like I said, over 500 total, though, um, have observed some form of this behavior. Homosexual animal sexuality in animals is seen as controversial by social conservatives because it asserts the naturalness of homosexuality in humans while others counter that it has no implications and is nonsensical to equate natural animal behavior behaviors to morality. So I leave it up to you where, you know, you decide to fall within that sort of perspective. I will, however, mention a few examples. So humans' closest relatives on the, you know, tree of life are chimps and bonobos. Bonobos, in particular, uh, they live within female-centered or matriarchal groups, they are egalitarian, and these groups very often, um, they perform sexual acts to form peaceful bonds with each other because they prefer to use sex rather than have uh, violence amongst themselves or between groups. Other things that we tend to observe, both males and females copulate face-to-face. -face. Um, females tend to rub their genitals together. Males have been seen to rub their scrotums on the buttocks of another male or to even ru um, rub their erect penises together. Another interesting example then is that females who might transfer to an unfamiliar or you know another hostile group, when they enter, they seek out other women, senior females within the community, the new group, to rub their genitals on again to form these new sorts of relationships. Penguins are another example. They will form same-sex pairs to encourage the survival of their offspring. They've been observed in nature performing mating rituals, but are often not seen engaging in sex. Um, this is interpreted as a way of strengthening the bond between them, and is also used as a visual reminder to the community that they are together. 
Now, one famous example of two male chinstrap penguins who were in captivity at the Central Park Zoo. This is from a case from like the late 90s, I believe. Um, <clears throat> they did form a same-sex union. They attempted to hatch a rock at one point. Um, and when the zookeeper started to see this, they ended up giving them an egg to raise. That egg became little baby Tango that you see depicted in the image to the right. This is out of a children's book written about Roy and Silo. Um, Tango herself actually formed a same-sex relationship, and Roy and Silo went on to inspire other gay couples, penguin couples, within the, within the zoo. Silo did, however, end up pairing with a female penguin later on called Scrappy. So it wasn't, you know, happily ever after, but happily for quite a while. Okay, now coming back around to, you know, the sort of categorization we talked about, there's a concept called compulsory heterosexuality, and this is a concept that is defined by Adrian Rich. You can see the cover of their book there on the left. And what this was talking about is really the institutionalization of heterosexuality. And in this way, heterosex heterosexuality is assumed and enforced by a patriarchal and heteronormative society. Institutions, therefore, such as marriage, are merely socializations that have been internalized and reproduced in society. This institution, in particular, defines the standards for sexual and romantic relationships and alienates those outside of the standard. Compulsory heterosexuality views... Excuse me. Sorry. Um, what we need to recognize nowadays, though, is that the rights of lesbians, gay, and bisexual people to live non-heterosexual lives... Um, unfortunately, there are still some laws, religions, and justice systems that allow for harassment and violence against people who live non-heterosexual lives. Um, and economic systems themselves do tend to still make women reliant on hetero marriage. If, however, it was socially accepted to be a lesbian or for women to be economically independent, the patriarchy would crumble. Men would be less able to exploit women's sexuality and labor, um, the patriarchy just cannot exist without motherhood and the suppression of women's sexuality outside of marriage. Hiding lesbian and bisexual women, therefore, is a means of keeping heterosexuality compulsory. A few examples of this, there's actually no word for lesbian in some language, Asian languages. Um, a top scientist in India has been quoted as saying there is no homosexuality in his country because there are laws against it. Members of the UN say that lesbianism tends to be only occur in, you know, white Western cultures, and obviously this is not the case. Anthropologists, too, have not helped. Um, you know, early on, this was a concept, homosexuality was, was ignored by many early practitioners. This can, however, become a really a human rights issue. So among ultra-Orthodox Jewish lawmakers in Israel, they were suggesting, you know, setting up these sort of rehabilitation centers to, quote-unquote, cure homosexuals, and went on to blame them for uh, earthquakes that were experienced within the country. Many believe this ended up fueling a 2009 attack on the Tel Aviv Gay and Lesbian Center, which led to the death of two people and injured several other, uh, mostly teenagers. When we look at this, unfortunately, um, several hate crimes can be tied to compulsory heterosexuality. Already this year, in 2021, um, there have been 15 murders of transgender or gender nonconforming people, and they are the people that you see listed here. Uh, if we look back to another example from December of 2013, you know, a fire was started in a gay nightclub within, in Seattle. Um, the perpetrator was quoted as saying that homosexuals should be exterminated. Uh, he, you know, comes from a culture that suppresses homosexuality, and despite not being charged as a hate crime, he was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. What these examples are showing us, then, is that, you know, compulsory heterosexuality plus the invisibility of lesbian and bisexual people contribute to violence and homosexual rights violations. So rather than dwelling on, you know, the negative outcomes and consequences of compulsory hetero heteronormativity, um, for your discussion this week, I want you to consider the following questions. 
you know, looking at gender identities more widely. What would the world be like if homosexuality, bisexuality, and non-conforming gender identities were not stigmatized? Um, how would it influence affection between those of the same sex? How would it affect what jobs we choose, how children play, what we wear, or even marriage itself? I look forward to reading your responses.